Welcome back to Games Now! My name is Anna-Kasa Kultima and you're watching this stream straight from Aalto University Otaniemi Campus in Espoo, Finland. And um, I'm here with my lovely co-host Tolly Park. Hello, everyone. And we have tried to familiarize as best possibility of today's topic also with our uh, play together uh, last yeah. week. Yes. So today we talk about actually one of the very dominant trends in game industry and that's free, free to play games uh, model. Uh, but yeah, if you are uh, unfamiliar, if you're new to the games now, make sure that you follow our uh, channels in every single social media outlet out there so that you get all the updates you know uh, what's happening next, you know all the awesome game gems that we run, for instance, and all the wonderful <laughs> talks, <laughs> too. Oh, it's the pollen time. Yes, uh, <laughs> that's that time of the year in here. Welcome to R Finland. Yeah, uh, oh. right. So, basically, today we have a uh, guest of honor from uh, Tampere University. Let's have Kati to the stage. Hello. Hello. Hi, how are you doing? Pretty good. Thank the you. Nice to be here. The train ride from Tampere to Helsinki was uh, it, it okay. was it was okay, late <laughs> as usual. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So um so Kati, you're gonna talk about free to play games uh today. Mm -hmm. uh, so tell us a little bit like how 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 do you know about free to play games? You are actually Dr. Alha. Yes, yes. I, I did write my PhD on free to play games and especially uh, about the attitudes and opinions and experiences in these games and how they have changed games. So that right. is especially what I know about. Yeah. yeah, and you have also played yourself quite many of the games. I have, I have, yes. And yeah. paid a lot? No, oh. I haven't. Ooh, that's <laughs> I, have, I have paid a little. Okay, that's an, another <laughs> tactic that, that we can discuss today. Yeah. Yes. So we're gonna hopefully like have a really uh, interesting discussion also. So if you have any questions in the uh, chat stream, uh, feel free or in our Discord server, you can also do that. And if you have any questions to Kati before we let her just speak, just make sure that you put them in the chat and we'll address them for you um, uh, at the question and answer time. But I guess like we don't, let's not keep this. Oh, oh, Solif has a note. Yeah, so I'm also gonna do the live oh, illustration. Yes. Yes. So if you happen to see doodling going around on the screen, that's me drawing <laughs> and this image will also be shared after the lecture and our social media, which is why you should subscribe us. Yes, yes, and Good. come to our Discord <laughs> channel because the full image will be there. Yes. Uh, I will be trying to play as much as I can focus some of the free-to-play games that might be quite uh, popular um, during the stream, but we'll see like uh, what goes there. So there's a little bit more action than just the talk, but let's give the stage to Kati so that we can get all the wonderful details, the critical view on this massive trend in the industry. Yes, exactly. There you go. Stage is yours. Yes. Thank you, and thank you for inviting me here. This is uh, I've been waiting forward to this lecture for a while now. This is this is one of my favorite topics currently to talk about. So today we are going to talk about free to free to play games, and especially I'm taking this kind of critical approach to this. And the cri critical approach is maybe on two levels. One is towards the games, and one is is towards how we talk about them. But you will hear more about this as we progress. Uh, well, like said, I I wrote my PhD on free-to-play games. Currently I am working uh, in the Center of Excellence in Game Culture Studies in Tampere University as a university lecturer and game researcher. And I have studied these games for a while. So I, I, I just checked that first time that I did anything in at the university related to free-to-play games was in 2011 and that was when it was still just like uh, racing to be the big phenomenon that it is now. And then my, my PhD work was like uh, almost a decade of, of work. That's and you massive. Can... Wow. <laughs> that is such yes. a long time. Yeah. Ten years. Wow. Yeah. Although I have to say that I didn't concentrate on that only. I have also studied many other things uh, on the side. I, I like to branch out. But this has been the, like the, my main focus and, and what I have been returning to. And you can also find find the dissertation freely online, so if you want to read more about it. I think it's also uh, important to note that, that I have been a gamer since a, since, since a child, and I have played a lot of premium games, and then now I also have played uh, many free-to-play games. And that's important because my position here 
has been previously that I also have had this negative attitudes towards free to play games because they have been different from the games that I have loved. And mm. and into this we will come back many times today. Uh, a bit how I structured this lecture. First we gonna have this kind of premise, talk a little bit about what these games are, where they, where they came from and how they have been perceived. Uh, then we will look into how they work, at least on some level. We will not be able to completely go into the deep with this uh, with this short time that we have. And then uh, we are going to talk about problems and critique towards these games, and then values in games and biases that we might have. And then have a little recap in the end. So let's get started. First, before talking about free-to-play games, we have to define what we mean with them. And free-to-play games, even if it sounds like a simple term and we all kind of know what we talk about when we uh, mention free-to-play games, it has been defined differently. And none of these uh, definitions are correct or wrong, they're just from different perspectives. For instance, uh, uh, some people, or so in some occasions, Free-to-play games cover everything, all the games that can be accessed for free, whether they are monetized or not. Uh, and and some can be accessed for free, but then they might contain some monetization mechanics, for instance, some light advertising or something that they can get some revenues from the game. And then the third and fourth are pretty similar games that can be accessed for free, but they contain in-app purchases. But the third one also includes the games that have paywalls, for instance, demo games or server games or games on mobile that you can download for free, but then you only have a, like a button there that this unlocks the whole game. And those are called free-to-play games in those stores. But maybe when I talk about free-to-play games, they are games that can be played uh, relatively free freely also without money, mm. but then you can use money if you want with him then. Mm -hmm. uh, and sometimes this model has also been called the microtransaction model relating to the several small uh, money payments inside them, all the freemium model. And there's a little bit like uh, differences and nuances in these different terms. But I, I use free to play games. Is there also like advertising uh, funded games in this third uh, definition then yeah I I, I, yeah. I think they can yeah belong but uh, these are like these are not the only deficient definitions that can be made mm. okay and uh, then we're gonna have a little bit of brief history to understand where did they come from because often we just they just it just feels that they just suddenly were here but they do have history and I have tried to squeeze it into this one slide and uh, on the left, you can see virtual worlds as one of the influences that um, was one of the early freemium services. And, and these are not games, but they are definitely playful and you can play games inside them. Uh, for instance, something like ha ha Happu Hotel in Finland. Mm. So you could access those for free, but then you would have some premium accounts or you could buy things inside like virtual items and then that was like one of the early moments when we realized that there's a significant economy in people buying virtual items from each other in like, this like reindeer reindeer poo yes like <laughs> reindeer poo <laughs> in, yeah. in uh, Hapa hotel yes <laughs> and yeah. by the way co currently playing uh, uh candy crush so you mm -hmm. Uh, then another that <laughs> mentioned is some delicious. Uh, there were, I, I would say, it's one of the crucial points where the free-to-play games came into the international audience, also. And maybe as a backstory, maybe Solib knows more about this, but uh, in being Korean, yes, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, but. Uh, one of the reasons that affected this model being birthed 
in South Korea was that Japanese imports were uh, banned from the country since till uh, I think 98. Yeah, 1998. Y- yes. Yeah, and when consoles like Nintendo SNES and Sega were like very popular throughout the world. In South Korea, there were not many of those consoles, no. and some of them were pirated and so on. Yeah, and it was very expensive mm. and difficult to get yeah. as well. Yeah. So, yeah. so the focus became more like in computer games, and with the rising economy also, there was uh, effort to build fast internet. So it had all the like the uh, all the parts to create these com- online computer games, and and then also in these games it was starting to be seen that players actually want to buy these things inside the games. This is maybe also part of the games as services that I have there in the top um, because one of the one of the reasons free to play is has been so popular uh, in South Korea and China is that it it's it's kind of this uh, piracy repellent. So when you provide the game for free and then you can buy buy things inside the game, it is okay if if the game spreads freely and it's even good for the game. And there are like a Maple Story, for instance, is one of the uh, early very famous examples uh, that came from South Korea and was very popular also, still very well known also in the West. Mm. Uh, and then uh, also the compu- competitive computer games that is in the bottom is something that also started to rise. South Korea also had those. And uh, in the West, League of Legends was one of the early ones to to come out. And again, it was noticed that ba- paying for for cosmetic things inside this kind mm-hmm. of game is is really really um, beneficial. The games can make a lot of money. I I, can't, I have to uh, we have to adjust the audio level of me playing Candy Crush because <laughs> apparently it's just really loud. Oh no! Oh, no. So <laughs> let's just let's just tone it down or just <laughs> also get rid of the sounds. I mean, they are then completely <laughs> so that we don't ruin cutting. <laughs> right, we they can't are nice hear sounds it here though. In the studio, we can't huh? hear anything here, so. Mm. <laughs> It has pretty like lucrative sound. Yes, <laughs> design. It does. Yeah. Uh, then uh, the rise of social media was one of also the early uh, turning points in free-to-play games, especially Facebook when they released the the, the uh, API to make third-party games, and especially Zynga was really big at that time, making all these farming games. Mafia Wars games, uh, Cityville, and and all all of these, and again very popular. And and this is also connected. This and the uh, mobile games is connected to the casual turn of of games. How these uh, smaller puzzle games and other games became really big, and and the audience of players become become to much bigger than before. And especially when smartphones started started to be very, very popular. It was easy to have a, this huge market and make mobile games. First mobile games was were more, most of the time all like the first smartphone games. Of course, there were many mobile games also before that were paid. But quite soon the market got saturi- saturized and, and uh, the prices of these games came really low and it, it started to be hard to sell anything for more than, let's say, one mm. euro. So the free-to-play games, again, something that can solve these issues. Um, but yeah, well, what is noticeable here is that there are these different places where we can see parts of this model coming from. So it didn't come from one spot and it, it didn't appear suddenly. It, it evolved throughout the time. And I marked some of these games, not gonna go into detail into this uh, timeline, but in, in this timeline I have marked some of the well-known games to see that maybe the social network games do comprise this small 
uh, quite tight unit. Uh, but all the other games kind of like appear on top of each other. So computer games were early and then social network games were really big for a short while and then mobile games become maybe the biggest of these games. And it has started already in the 90s. Okay. So now we know a bit like where did they come from and what, what are we talking about. Uh, then we know that these games are successful, but do we know how successful they are? So here are, here are some numbers and this is from Superdata's uh, research. And according to them, digital games made an 126.6 billion in 2020. And free-to-play games generated 78 percent of this. And we can pause here because let's say it again, from all revenue made from digital games, around four fifths is made by games that anyone can play for free. Mm. And that's huge. And it's also like uh, sounds contradictory yeah. to, to some people, I yes. guess. But yeah, free to it play. Does. There's no free lunch. Mm. And further, that, further to that, 75% of free-to-play game revenues come, came from mobile games. Mm, that's huge. So small games that you can pay, play for free amount this, is, is this huge industry. Uh, and that is maybe surprising when you hear these numbers for the first time. Mm. Uh, Asia, Asia is the biggest uh, area for these games, 59%. Uh, of the revenues were generated from from there, and also the success of Finnish game industry, it leans heavily on free-to-play model as well. The like the biggest companies that make most of the money are doing free-to-play games, especially uh, Supercell. Uh, but now we also have other big com companies making free-to-play games. And currently, I think. Super Supercell still accounts more than half of Finnish game mm. industry's revenues. It has come down a bit, but still, according to Neo Games. Yeah. So these are huge games. I have this, uh, maybe you have seen this uh, image from Visual Capitalist. They m visualized the, the, the growth of gaming revenues and Again, don't need to go to details. This is really interesting, although also not maybe completely uh, correct in all of the parts. But it's really interesting to see how these different uh, factions of gaming have developed. For instance, PC has slowly become a bit bigger. Consoles have now been at the same for a long time. Arcade understandably has shrunk a lot. And handheld almost died at this moment, according to this. Maybe because Switch is is also functions as, as a handheld. Mm. But what is what is like what is the biggest uh, surprise here? Or oh, maybe not surprise, but this just visualizes how mobile games have exploded. So they started in in the nineties with very simple games like Snake on on Nokia phones, and now they are an industry of 85 billion, according to these numbers. So this is something to keep an eye on, even if if you wouldn't appreciate the games. Then a few words about the backlash, because these games have been uh, viewed very much negatively. And these are some titles from uh, a few newspapers, uh, online newspapers, gaming, uh, gaming media mostly. And first is why free to play is ruining gaming. I, I, if I remember correctly, these first that I collected are maybe in the 2014 around. Uh, to, to 2016 maybe, 
when it was really a lot in the titles in media. We have others. This is pretty new. And it's about the new Tomb Raider game. And even the title says that here's the part that that's gonna really piss you off. It's on mobile. <laughs> <laughs> and and being on mobile, it's also most likely free to play. Mm. And this tells a lot about the attitudes of game media and players towards these games. Mm. Mobile Tomb Raider is not a real Tomb Raider game. It's something that that you you get excited that there's gonna be a new game, but then you get angry because it's not the right kind of game. It's such a it's, it's such amazing how mm. the mobile devices have mm. now developed. Like it they is. are exactly as powerful platforms as 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 consoles, for instance. Yes, so you can have the what is it called cross uh, platform cross, play yes, can. between mobile and a console. So we are mm. in that spot now, and it's just you know it's just breaking mm -hmm. my brain in a way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of like from the snake. <laughs> yes, from the today. snake. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, there's a there's a lot of this here. Uh, even the most promising game can be ruined by free to play foolishness. <laughs> <laughs> uh, then maybe some some remember these titles where or headlines where parents were uh or, or the children were spending a lot of money suddenly yeah. on a free game. I think there were several of these. Yeah. Here, Apple is refusing to refund them. I I think nowadays there are some mechanisms that they need to be refunded if if it's uh, appealed in a certain time. Free to play is the worst thing to happen to video gaming. <laughs> <laughs> no. Yeah, mm. heated views. Yeah. Yes. And like I said, there's there's a lot. Mm. So. This shows There's a bit. There's a lot. Yes, lot. <laughs> <laughs> so there's a, th this shows the, the uh, attitudes towards these games, especially like a few years back. I think it's it's a little bit different now, uh, as we have maybe gotten used to the games, and we have a lot of games that players enjoy, and the games have evolved. But uh, a few years ago, still it was quite vocal, and the premise uh, for this lecture and also for my own research has been the, the like the contradiction of free to play games being so so immensely successful but then they are treated really negatively like critically is maybe down down yeah, it, yeah they are they they were hated mm. and that showed uh, it so it was shown in the like forums and YouTube video comment section and, and so on, how much hate there was towards these games. And still is some. And and the conflict that was there and still is, has been seen as this kind of battle that we have had these uh, premium games that you pay once and then you own the game. And they are made with love to players and they are these like a package of honed experience and a story that the player can play. And then there comes these free-to-play games and does everything completely different. You don't own the game and you have to pay, keep on paying for it. And they are, they are here and they are everywhere and they are going to ruin our games. Mm. And it was especially between like this kind of triple-A uh, one one time purchase games and then free to play games and also maybe a little bit between free to play games and and indie and this kind of artistic creation versus this kind of commercialism in in free to play games but it's uh, games game industry has never been like one or two revenue models and in this this um table i am listing a few of them there might might be more than these but we can see that it's not just the one-time payment and free-to-play or even one-time payment and scrap si subscription and free-to-play. But there's a lot of different ways to try to get money from games. For instance, shareware games and uh, pa paper play games, which I mean, uh, for instance, the arcade games that you pay for each time that you play them 
or slot machines, or maybe we, we uh, when we talk about early mobile games, we had these like text message games where you pay for each text message that you send. So there are different models, and there have always been different models. So the one-time payment is not the original model, and it's not the only model. And there's there's connections between these different models. For instance, with free play, free games, free to play games, they have the connections that player can access and play the full game free of charge. And it is typically a smaller launch budget because you have to get the game out soon in free to play games to see whether it's worth continuing. Paper play and free to play games uh, have the Ha, have bo both have the, the criticized thing in free to play games that the player can and has to make monetary decisions while they are playing the game because in arcade games if you lose you can play, you can pay more and you can continue or you can decide to stop playing and the gameplay has been uh, developed around that so the games are made for instance, with time limits or increased difficulty, so the player will eventually fail and have to either stop playing or pay more. So this is very similar to free-to-play model, just in a little bit a different way. And then demos and trials, uh, where player can pay to have more of the game. And here I think the most important thing connecting it to the free-to-play is that both of these has to have a really focus in the first impression, in the first moments of playing the game. Because then, only then, they can be monetized if the, if the very first experience is good. And then subscription model, uh, where players can pay for the game for several times. And the game is never ending as such a, like free-to-play games. So constantly there's more and more content, the game never ends, there's no like one story that goes from beginning to end, but there's always more. So there are these connections to other revenue models, it's not free-to-play games, it's not somehow out there against the other models, but it is one of them. Okay, then how do they work? Uh, first of all, I want to briefly introduce the ARM model, because it's really central in free-to-play games. So uh, A stands for acquisition, re R stands for re retention, and M stands for monetization. And these form this kind of a funnel that the players uh, have to be first acquired into the game, and then many of them quit right away, and some of them stay, and that's the retention of, of trying to retain the players. And then again, some of them will go away, but then part of them will go further into the funnel and, and are monetized. And here in free to play games, the retention is the most crucial one to look at if you want to know whether the game will be success or not, because everything else can be modified. You can gain more players later if you didn't get them in the beginning, you can try to uh, fiddle around with the monetization mechanics, but if the game is not engaging enough to keep the players, then it's better maybe to scrap it in the beginning than try to make it work. Uh, for monetization, there's several ways to gain uh, m money, and one of them is obviously advertising, and there's different types of advertising. Product placement is, I don't think, that common in free-to-play games, but especially uh, mobile games and especially the Facebook games did have a lot of banners, for instance, visible in the game while playing, and those could show ads. And then there's these full-screen ads uh, in many of these games that you can, uh, you may be forced to watch to continue playing, or you may watch them, for instance, to continue playing when you run out of lives. I find Design Home is a really interesting mm. product placement uh, That's example true. because it has this actual furniture that are advertised in the game. I don't know if we can see some here, but 
if you yeah. go for the challenge and then you see the furniture here you pick and these actually these these furniture you don't see that much from here that but these actually exist as products as physical mm -hmm. products and i haven't seen anything like that before but design home is just really <laughs> huge also yeah it, so it's they're, they're really doing something really interesting in there yeah. it would be really interesting to hear more about like the the revenue, revenue model, model yeah. like how yeah. is it done yeah i have yeah. no idea what is the the connection between the but maybe somebody knows in the chat i don't know <laughs> uh, what is the connection between the the furniture cr uh, vendors and then the game itself so mm -hmm. who actually pays for who i don't yeah. know how it works yeah. yeah but that's a good example mm -hmm. Uh, then free-to-play games, especially mobile games, do a lot of cross-promotion. So advertising other games uh, inside other games. And this also is a mechanic for acquisition, for, of course, to, to those games. And then something worth mentioning is uh, that free-to-play games can also use player data and, and the work that is done by the players of labor for monetization uh, because these games collect a massive amounts of data from the players so there are questions then how is this data used uh, of course it is used to develop the game and that's good these games are very metrics based there's a lot of analytics behind how to advance the game design but m there's other things like maybe profiling players into sections and then giving them targeted ads. If there's no permission to this, then there is a problem. And there's especially a problem if the data is sell sold to third parties. And then if, if any personal data is collected, why and how is it handled? And of course there's security issues if there are any leaks or something of the data. And this of course uh, is crucial in games that you can use, for instance, your credit card information. Uh, then location-based games have added even a new layer to this because they are tracking all the time. Where are you going? Where are you moving? And you're taking pictures within the game, you're taking video. So how is that used? And Pokemon, in Pokemon Go, you can actually scan the Pokestops and send that data to, to Niantic. And we don't know how that data will be used eventually. So that is also interesting. And of course, player created content. How is that used? Are uh, the players being abused? Um, is the company collecting all the profit? And then uh, virality, so spreading the games to other players, for instance, through social media is something that the, the games can do. But then, then the, like the largest money comes through in-app purchases. And here's one way to, to categorize these uh, purchases. This is, this is by me based on some, some other categories. And the most clear distinction is, distinction is between cosmetic purchases and then functional purchases. Uh, if if something that you buy has an effect on the gameplay, then there might be some problems related to that. And in this categorization, the functional is further divided into convenience, which like makes the game more pleasant. For instance, it could be more inventory space, so you don't have to always shuffle through your items. And then there's advancement, for instance, skipping timers and so on to get to get forward faster. And then there's power, which is the most debated one. So getting, for instance, boosters to make you more powerful or even some uh, items like weapons or something. Uh, and these kind of items can then inf interfere with the game's balance and they might be called something uh, like pay to win games. And this is something that maybe gets the most uh, M all like most backlash in these games is is being pay to win from players, and then there's social added here, which means any kind of shared boosters, uh, gifts, maybe some kind of social chats or something like that. 
and we have a, a case here, uh, something that Pokemon Go sells. So there's various different ways to to buy items in Pokemon Go. You can increase your Pokemon storage. Like said, this could be thought as a convenience purchase. Then you can buy Pokeballs if you run out, and you can buy egg incubators to mo more rapidly uh, hatch your eggs that hatch into Pokemon. And then the lure module is really interesting because that was one of the first this kind of shared boosters or well well known shared boosters. So one person can use this, and then everyone around the same area uh, has the benefit of seeing more Pokemon and catching them. And then there's the cosmetic purchases, for instance, different kinds of clothes, different kinds of poses. Uh, and then what is interesting is that n you can maybe see that the price of these items, none of them is real money, it's the in-game currency. And you can separately buy that currency. But you cannot usually buy the items directly with money. And this is how it often is in other games as well. Uh, most frequently used is the double currency model, which means that there's two kinds of currencies in inside the games. There's soft currency that can easily be gained through playing the game, and then there's the hard currency that is more rare and can bo be bought with real money. And then you can buy hard currency with real money, and you can buy soft currency with hard currency or real money, but you cannot transfer anything back to real money. Or you cannot transfer soft currency to hard currency. There are some, some excep exceptions to this, and many nowadays might use single currency or uh, directly money. And this is one example from uh, Hogwarts Mystery. Uh, it is very in the beginning of the game where you still don't know what the game is about, but they are selling this pet cat to take with you to the school. Uh, you still don't know what the what the cat will actually do, how it will be in the game, but if you buy it now, you get fifty percent off, or you can wait until later and maybe get it for free. But you don't know what how long the chapters are and when chapter four will be. So this is a bit like maybe iffy because the player doesn't know what they are buying here. They don't know the value of yes. it. Yes. Yeah. But because it's fifty percent off, it <laughs> it is like this like temptation to get it now because it's gonna be more expensive if you change mm. your mind. There are like early adopter <laughs> benefits. Mm. Or it could my be a good investment or <laughs> not. Yeah. My father used to say that if it's fifty percent you buy two. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. <laughs> so yeah. you win money. Yeah. That's <laughs> a different generation. Yeah. Uh, another uh, kind of theory behind these mechanics for monetization are from behavior uh, economics, uh, which which are this like how we are making decisions when we are buying things. And we can find several of these from free to play games. And for instance, sunk cost fallacy is is this type of feeling that we, when we have put something in into the game, like if we have put time and money into the game, we we are more likely to put even more time and money, even if it wouldn't be sensible, because we don't want to lose kind of the like the the effort and money that we have already put in the game. Then status quo effect or default bias is, is when the game uh, pre-selects something for you. So you think that is the reasonable choice to make. So if, the, for instance, from a list of purchases, the middle one is crossed, you're more likely to get that than, than to change it. Mm. Or if you get like yes, no question and the yes is already ticked, it's mm. more probable you, that you choose the yes than no. And then insensitivity to income changes is what some free-to-play games do, is that they give in the beginning uh, the hard currency more, so you get adjusted to a certain level, and then they start giving it less, but you don't want it, or like the, the change is not comfortable, so then you might want to buy and replace the lost value to keep on to having the same level. 
And these are really interesting. There are, there are more of these. I put the link from Juho Hamari's uh, article for this, so you can check it yourself. Uh, and and there's different ways to see this. Are these are these tricks that try to make us do something that we don't want to, or are these just like normal mechanics that make the game more engaging and makes us want to pay money for it? And of course, games are not the only area that where these kinds of mechanics are used. Just everyday shopping in stores include a lot of things from mm -hmm. behavior economics, like just how the items are set, how they are priced, and so on. Where they what, are what, placed. Y yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Here's an example of, of maybe a little bit like the sunk cost fallacy. Uh, game, especially mobile games and Facebook games or social network games included these include these waiting mechanics like lives. When you run out of lives, you have to stop playing and wait for for them to come back, or you can pay. Or oh, energy mechanics, or oh, time counters. So all all sort of things that make you wait. And then some of the mechanics are uh, risk of losing something, losing progress or losing rewards. For instance, withering crops in Farmville or daily streaks. So if you have a daily streak and then you miss one day and you come back the next day, in some games it's still possible to pay some in-game currency to fix the streak and continue it. And here in the picture is the, is the gameplay, gameplay loop of growing crops in, in Farmville. So you plant the plants and you wait them to grow or you can pay to make it quicker and then you come back to the game and you har make a harvest and then you can grow more crops. But if you come too late, the, the plants have died and then you have the option to pay or use paid items to make them come back alive. Or you can admit your defeat and lose the reward and restart. And here it might might feel really bad that you killed these plants and you maybe want to fix the situation. There was a Facebook game early on, like similar to uh, Farmville, where you were growing also animals. Oh yeah, I remember. I can't that remember one. what was the name of the. But they, they guess the uh, was a Bobcat that acquired this studio mm. in San Francisco based. But like, it was so sad to see like uh, tiny squirrels or something laying yeah. dead on your. <laughs> on your oh yeah, yard, yeah, so it really paid for. Like, I remember those that emotions. That, yeah, I remember that at some point. All yeah. my animals were dead. Yeah. <laughs> it's like it was quite typical to be yeah. honest in in yeah. in that space yeah yeah it's very interesting okay more mechanics uh, a lot of the talk the critical talk about free to play games is now about loot boxes mm. and earlier and still also about gacha mechanics so these are random boxes that have different kinds of rewards inside them and there are different types of gachas and different types of loot boxes. And some of them can be really controversial. And we were just talking about complete gachas or combo gachas, where you have to collect all of, of the content. So you, in the beginning, when you, when you buy, buy things from gachas, you get a lot of progress because you get a lot of new things. But the longer you go, it gets rarer and rarer that you get something new. And in the end, it's almost impossible to get the remaining ones. And players still like spend money to try to get it. And some of these mechanics have been banned, for instance, in Japan. Mm. Kumpu gacha. Mm -hmm. yep. uh, then in, in loot boxes, uh, one of the controversial is that they are some, like they resemble gambling. Because mm. the, there's always something inside the box, so every ticket wins. But then sometimes there's something really rare and something that you want. Uh, and and when you get that, you get this like a boost of of like uh, joy, and that may hook you to buy even more mm. loot boxes. And especially if these are seen as gambling then that is problematic because gambling is 
is uh, regulated in a different way than other digital games. And that might mean and has mean, meant in some games that loot boxes have been banned completely. And then maybe maybe as like a, a step forward before everything concerning loot boxes has been banned, battle passes have been rising recently. There's also similar type of like event tickets uh, and then a monthly subscriptions. And especially in the battle passes, you pay to access better rewards. But once you pay the, the season ticket or, or however it is uh, named, then you are very committed to the game because you need to to get uh, value for your money that you spent. Mm. Mm. Like a gym uh, Gym membership. season tickets yeah. and mm-hmm. memberships. Yes. And so, some of these also give the currency back. So if you play, play really well, you might get your money back. Yeah. Which again makes you like try really hard, and that has been uh, described even as like like that the player has been feeling burning out for the game mm. because they just feel like they need to keep playing. And if if you don't get to the end, if you don't get to the best rewards, you can again pay to get rest of the rewards. Mm. So there can be be problems with these types of mechanics also. But uh, whatever the way to monetize uh, free-to-play games have this challenge of finding the balance between good enough game experience for all the free players and then offering enough in- incentives to pay money to further improve the experience. And this is this is really difficult. And if the game is too aggressive, it is, if it has too uh, too many items behind the paywall or so on, then it is not good enough for the free players, and which means that the players will leave. And if it gives too much for free, then it, then the monetization doesn't work. So it's really delicate balance. Okay, we already discussed some problems previously. Uh, here are some more. Uh, these are these are more about the game experience and and maybe players' view that they have been expressing throughout these studies. And one more quite popular one is that free to play weakens the game experience. It makes it worse when it has this monetization model inside it. Either that the games are just crappy in general, they are made hastily just to get some money, uh, some being some kind of cash craps, or that uh, trying to get the, the balance doesn't make the game as good as not struggling with the balance would. Mm-hmm. And then uh, one one uh, claim is that free to play makes games unfair, especially the games where you are competing with other players, especially if there are power items that I mentioned earlier. Mm. So the game can be pay to win. If you pay more, you can do better. And this is this is not seen uh, as as a as the correct way to win, not with money, especially in the West. It's very frowned upon. And then there are these fears that fear to play expands too far. Uh, it takes over the game industry, and on on the other hand, it ruins games. Like we saw in the headlines, there's like this honest concern that free-to-play model ruins games. It ruins not just free-to-play games, but also other games because they start implementing these same mechanics inside them. Mm. And that has happened, of yes. course. Yeah. Yes, and we have some really bad examples and then maybe some better examples mm. of that. Uh, and one thing about the mechanics that I showed as examples is whether they are whether they are these kind of dark design patterns that Sagal et al. have, have defined 
and if they are like if if they if they are intentionally try to cause this kind of negative experience and against their own will and interest and without their consent then maybe there is something unethical happening or at, at least something that is not good for the game experience although i would claim that that is quite subjective what what of these dark patterns are actually dark patterns it it re- depends on, very much on the player for instance uh grinding and waiting are some of the examples in in this article and grinding and waiting in free to play games as is some for some players it's what it what it creates this kind of rhythm for the game mm-hmm. so they don't want to continue playing they want the game to say that okay now you have to wait until tomorrow that you can have a session again mm. and it fits to their style of playing so it regulates mm. the, the yeah. time used yeah mm-hmm. like and and for some others it is like no why do you why don't you allow me to play as long as i want i want more of the content but now i would have to pay and that's that's not cool <laughs> so it is very subjective i want to use your product but i don't <laughs> want to pay for it mm. <laughs> yes and uh, then those were m- maybe more about game experiences uh there's also issues here that are about ethical ethics and ethical issues uh especially if there's any manipulating or aggression behind marketing then that is some sometimes an ethical issue so if if the player is paying for something against their will or like against their interest of the, if they are pushed to buy something then that is clearly an ethical issue and connected to this lack of information if the player doesn't have enough information like for instance in the example of the cat pet in the hogwarts mystery game then they cannot make informed decision mm. to buy something and then we also mentioned the resemblance to gambling this is a problem if if it is seen as gambling then it needs to be regulated under gambling laws and then something really important is how children and young people play these games there have been games that have been targeted directly to children and then they have been still very aggressive in trying to monetize the game try to make the player to pay for items inside the game mm-hmm. and again i that that can be seen as an ethical issue and and many of these games the the age limits are more about the content it's not about how aggressive the monetization is and that is maybe something that we should look into more and then there's the addict addictiveness uh related to problem playing and what makes free to play games so problematic compared to other games that we can spend money on is that free to play games don't have the same kind of of roof of spending mm. you can you can go and and pay for games uh as much as you want yes mm. so or don't want yeah and and we again we saw that in the headline of of, of a child using over a thousand pounds to one single game and probably quite quickly because it was caught up and and this this is why why problem playing can have serious eco- economical consequences to the players and we should we should uh, look into that there is some research being done on on this but we still don't have enough to know how do these games work not 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 as much for instance that we do have in, about gambling mm. such a much kind of older industry as well mm, it is lo- existed so, so long already like from the 30s in finland mm-hmm. yes uh, so well yeah. obviously <laughs> <laughs> the company well, that we have yeah, from the 30s yeah. but it has existed like yeah. as long as humans probably yes i think gambling is something that yeah. just it throws us in but that is like gambling industry is a good example they have existed much longer they have similar kind of problems and they also have some kind of solutions to those problems and free to play games could maybe take some example from those for instance allowing tools to follow how much you're spending allow 
the players to set some kind some kind of maximum money amounts every month, how much they can spend and so on, so that the player has the power to to help if they are feeling that they are spending too much or spending more than mm. they can afford. But I haven't seen many of these kinds of tools in free to play games. Mm. I guess uh, they have to be pushed by regulation. Yeah, I, I think mm. so. Or they have to be some kind of third-party tools, maybe. Mm. And there's always like thin lines between what is gambling and what mm -hmm. is game that has gambling yeah. components. There's always a very this vague line, and mm -hmm. it's very subjective sometimes as well. It is. So mm. yeah. But a lot of the things in like how we interpret also law is like it's it exactly mm. yeah. Things are very easy, very really hard to make really clear cut lines mm -hmm. of how the society works and uh, digital games is just so new to a lot of people especially like uh, lawmakers mm -hmm. and decision makers they don't understand this field yeah mm -hmm. almost at all so indeed yeah yeah and and for instance in finland we have the definition for gambling and it includes that you also get money back from it yeah. and from most of these games you don't but is is that the way that we always want to define gambling? Also, yeah. do we think about it again now that we have all these different things that could mm. could be considered as gambling? Mm. So Especially maybe. like uh, when it has the similar kind of negative impact mm. to your household. Yes. In terms and, of economic and loss. Uh, and the items that you gain do have value to you mm. and inside the game. So yeah. I guess like a lot of the things like why we are so behind is that we've had such a toxic... Uh, understanding of games that games are just not mm. interesting games are not valuable games are not impactful mm -hmm. and that all reflects back to the the way that we treat them also under the law indeed in different societies mm -hmm. because these are not universal mm -hmm. laws these yeah. are not international there's no there's 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 not a possibility to to kind of make an international global law no. for all the companies that actually work on the global market so mm. it has to be like national yeah national uh, rules for this mm. and there have been like national rules of, of yeah. banning for instance loot boxes in certain yeah. countries and so on so these are interesting examples I, I don't know if i agree with the blanket bans but at least we can learn from them and how, how do mm. they affect uh, mm. the last ethical issue if we go forward is is privacy and data use we already mentioned this um so there if, if if the game leaks the data if it sells to third parties and so on that that is a clear ethical issue and then ho how the data is used even by the company does the does the game all really need all the information that is asking from you mm. And there we go to the metrics driven design <laughs> where <laughs> where it's kinda needed for to get all the info of the yeah. players. Mm. Like yes. Balance. Uh, the things that you do in the in the game, but do, does it really need to know everything like uh your date of birth and and uh your and email you and yeah. your or your friends on Facebook <laughs> and so on. Yeah, indeed. Well, we already went a bit forward to this slide. So regulation, there are already some regulation already before free-to-play games that can be applied to free-to-play games. How well they can be applied is debatable and how well they are applied is debatable. But we have to remember that these new types of games, new types of markets, they do bring new challenges to existing regulations. So we we have to at least have to look into the regulation and if it's if it's enough currently uh, and some mentioned i already mentioned the blanket bans on loot boxes and also there's been regulation on how these games can be marketed so that they cannot be marketed as free if they have in-app purchases they have to mm -hmm. be marketed as free to play and they have to have the mention of in-app purchases at least in certain marketplaces yeah now app store for apple they have that mm -hmm. mentioned but for yes. a long time it was impossible to mm -hmm. know before you download yeah, exactly it. Mm -hmm. yeah. so, so some of these things are going forward but what what is important but we need to have continuous discussions on this and we need to have new regulations when necessary we don't want to uh like uh, do harm to these games and but if we don't have 
the research that we need to understand these games and if we don't have the regulations then it can be something on maybe unfair to the companies like banning some things altogether mm. so we have to do the work now i think that the apple's restriction for the privacy thing came with the deadline and then it was pushed forward because it had mm. the h- largest impact for the smaller actors okay. that couldn't react to the, the because if their metrics were completely mm. dependent on the on the rights to use the the certain things so you can't it's like as a small company then you're completely destroyed by these changes if it comes too fast for instance yeah. so it's there's also the the developer side not just mm-hmm. the player side that we have to consider that somebody's of course is paying for their own mortgages from their business and 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 their kids get <laughs> get food mm-hmm. with that definitely um but yeah it's like it's it's a super big balance like i kind of also wanted to point it out that and maybe we'll point it out later that uh if a customer doesn't want to pay anything for a thing that you created like where is the ethics of that then mm. so it's like oftentimes the discussion is revolving around like whether w- like why do they push me to pay for this like because they made it and they need to get somehow financed back to mm-hmm. them because they use time for yes. that so like i i think that there should be this customer uh kind of um awareness as well is that they don't come out of thin mm-hmm. air mm, <laughs> they yeah. come out of the pockets of somebody putting money to the salaries of the studio workers so there's like it, it's a it's a new thing and then oftentimes mm-hmm. games are so kind of black boxes for mm-hmm. the players they don't understand how they're made yes. and then who makes them and all that kind yeah. of stuff so so there's there's so much more things to consider in the yeah. ethical discussion of m- games mm. I, i think related to that it was really interesting in the in the interviews that we did uh on paying players how even they were o- of the mind that even in the games that they paid a lot in it is like the right of the players to also play it completely free mm. and they didn't see that as a problem that there's these other players that don't pay for the game mm. they didn't see them as freeloaders mm. mm-hmm. mm. but they thought that it is their right to play the game yeah. free and yeah. i think that is like descriptive of this phenomenon yeah, yeah. so imagine you go to a, f- a food store and you're mm. like some people pay for this <laughs> milk but i just don't pay <laughs> for it because yeah. it's like i i only want i want to go through well it could be the reality of the future is that you go through this huge market store and see a lot of advertising <laughs> a lot of stuff so kind of there's no free lunch again mm. but it's like i don't want to pay for the milk but it's mm. always like th- that's a thing actually in the in the bigger supermarkets in finland the milk is always way on yes. the behind so that you would actually pay for a buy for the products and, yeah. and the, so it, it is already happening which is <laughs> uh, we're so used to the fact mm. that, that that's how our uh capitalistic wor- uh, world mm. works mm. Uh, but it's like we pay yeah. with our mm. our kind of exposure time yeah. for other products that then we will buy because we don't just go to a big supermarket and just buy the milk mm-hmm. yeah. it is a lot of willpower <laughs> <laughs> to do that so that you don't actually buy anything else that is placed really smartly so that you will yeah. see when you get the milk yeah and most okay. of us know the thing that we go to get one thing from the store and come back with then okay. yeah sometimes yeah. without the thing that you were supposed yeah. to buy so and sometimes the attention towards games is just completely unfair because it's such a new uh, phenomenon and and the the negativity the, the kind of attention that comes is that it, it's so it's so kind of looked at mm-hmm. but then we don't look at the stuff that we accepted since we were kids so because mm-hmm. we are normalized into yeah. those phenomena we we should mm-hmm. really also think about the ethics of mm-hmm. the supermarket selling me the milk that i only want to yeah. buy <laughs> <laughs> and talk yes. about to become like uh normalized of this yeah. free to play mm. games. I mean, yeah. I'm I'm Korean. I I uh, almost every games that mm. I played during my teenage since my teenage mm. were all free to play. To play. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And and uh, at some point in my life when I was very young, I never questioned it. Mm-hmm. Like of course, like games should be free to play and <laughs> either you pay for the time, like either you grind or mm. you pay to not grind. So mm, buying yeah. yourself a time, basically. So time is a value mm. in games, et cetera. So th- th- that type of concept sort of built in mm-hmm. throughout my yeah. entire gameplay experience mm-hmm. during my teenage. And mm-hmm. that's gonna definitely going to affect throughout my lifetime, yeah. uh, this concept. So 
Yeah, and I think that is happening right now with with the like the newest generations of players, because they are growing up and playing games in in a world where free to play games are out there, and and there's a lot of them, and they are everywhere, and they maybe don't question them that much because they have always been there for them, mm-hmm. uh, and they are, have used to play the games and ask for parents for for money to pay a, a thing from it, and and that's like normal. Yeah, yeah. and then for me when I was, so I first. Uh, heard about the video game console and the package game, the mm-hmm. game shop when I was in teenage. Mm-hmm. And then I remember my first impression was that oh, so you have to pay first mm-hmm. before you actually <laughs> yeah. play the game. What yeah. guarantees me? Like, why do yeah. I have to spend of like money upfront? So that was my reaction yeah, yeah. coming yeah. from this, yeah. surrounded by all those free to play games. Yeah. And then when I said this story to my friends in America mm. later, once I went to study there. And they were like, "Of course, you have to pay up front to play the game." And I was like, "Why?" <laughs> and this, like, this <laughs> fundamental uh, topic mm-hmm. conflict yeah. kind of emerged right there. But so in a, in a way, we kind of share the similar experience. But I, I'm a bit older, so I I went in the footsteps of uh, footsteps of my brother, and that was the time of the Commodore 64 games. It's like when somebody had an actual box of the games. Like, mm-hmm. wow, you yeah. paid for it. <laughs> because all the games that we played were just uh, copied, uh, right, like right. single Same. copies, like that. That was the way that we played the games. Mm. So I don't know how that has impacted. Yeah. Like, I have to think about this. But, yeah. but yeah, I mean, th- there was this element of not paying anything because you don't have the money to at that point, and then somebody mm. had a rich yeah. uncle or something that paid for the games. Yeah, I, I remember. Well, we had Atari ST with similar experience. And I remember when I bought my first game from a shop, from yeah. an info. Yeah. And I was so excited because the I paid. Store, yeah. yeah. So I, I paid for it. So it must be good. And it looked, the oh, cover yeah. looked nice. Mm. And then it was total disappointment <laughs> because it was some like not very well known games, just some random game. And the games that I had copies of were actually good games because yeah. there was some like selection process maybe by my brother or somebody else mm-hmm. that was behind it. And Somebody and had the trouble to yeah. go through and copy it, so yeah. it, right. yeah, it was already mm. pre-selected. But yeah, it's just that mm. we don't think about too much of these experiences, I guess. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But yeah, that uh, that gives us the next topic, which is values and biases. Uh, so like said, and like we have discussed, there's a lot of negative attitudes towards free-to-play games. And they, this kind of experience have been seen as like inferior, unfair, manipulative, ethically dubious. Uh, but what needs to be understood that that player communities and players have views and values of what kind of game or what kind of player or what kind of way of playing is correct. And like for each of us, we have different history and we have learned a different kind of values through our history and, and and like said in my hi- my gaming history I also had this negative attitude towards these games mm. because it was not what I valued in my game experiences since I have uh I have uh, come to a different come to different values uh and also like a different attitudes towards these games and like I mentioned it's also questions of generations of players so different generations have different experiences and history and and through that different kinds of values and they can see these experiences differently so these are not objective objectively worse experiences or unfair gonna talk a little bit more about unfair in a bit but we do need to need, need to still look at them critically and think about ethical problems uh games have a lot of different kinds of values and traditional traditional in quotation marks game experience might uh include immersion or focus in narrative or challenge and skill based gaming and that is not often in free to play games especially if we t- talk about mobile free to play games they might have other values such as like the casual values and they might have the rhythm in it they might have slow progression and you have to have like this patience it might be a like this send bro- process that you go and click the things and then wait for the next day and click the things again so partly these negative attitudes are connected to these changes in values 
so free to play games are they objectively worse or do they just follow different values and cater to different audiences or to different needs and i i think i already answered that they are not objectively worse uh, and free to play games they especially break the meritocratic values in games and and more about that in here so in meritocracy everyone has uh, equal chance of of getting to the top so the most skilled and the people who put in most effort have the chance chance to rise to the top maybe win the game and and these values are something that a lot of games are based on they are really valued in our game industry and in, in our game culture and if something like spending money to do better comes in in here it it breaks these values so that is also one reason why why there's so, such an opposition to this but what we need to remember that that there are many many aspects in in games that make players be unequal even from the start before they start playing the game uh for instance access to best equipment it might be expensive to get the best mouse and keyboard to play mm. play the esports game so that you can get to the top um and a lot of the games still favor able bodied experiences and players uh and many of these games might have a community that is unwelcoming or toxic to women or minorities and there might be different amounts of time to use for instance if someone goes to work they have less time to be good than the person who doesn't who has more time to spend and then there's the conventions between different games that favor those who have a lot of experience in other games that are similar so these these kind of things make us not equal so it's never true meritocracy it's just uh, this kind of uh, utopia of meritocracy uh, and some free to play games do level out some of these challenges they do bring their own but for instance they are more accessible uh they, we have our own devices usually for instance smartphones that we can use to play many of them also are more accessible in other ways and many of them are also aimed to female audiences and don't necessarily uh require certain types of skills that are based on conventions and more about appreciation of these games or lack of appreciation so as said that they have these games have been seen as less valuable games uh, sometimes not even as real games uh and this dismissal have come, came, come from media it has come from game industry it ca- has come from players and it has come from us researchers also uh but what what we should acknowledge at this point that free to play games have a huge impact and it's not not just the amazing economic numbers that we saw previously it is just it is also it's also part of our game culture it's it's part of how we play games now and the variability of free to play games and and the accessibility has opened gaming to ever increased audience more people play games today than ever before and that is partly because of free to play games i i would say it's it's like critically also because of free to play games and we need to remember that playing games it's it's not a privilege of limited community of players it it belongs to everyone it's important enough to belong to everyone and also different ways to play for instance mobile free to play games is uh, is a valuable part of this um uh, also why what anna kaisa said about the digital games in being dismissed in, in general that is also something something that has happened and and there's these levels of dismissals towards digital games maybe games in general but then digital games especially uh they can be dismissed as uh, unimportant waste of waste of time unless they are somehow instrumental of like learning us or teaching us new things or making us exercise or somehow doing 
something outside the games function. If they are just fun by it, by themselves, they are not as important. But then these attitudes repeat also inside the games and game audiences towards different types of games. And free-to-play games is definitely one of these bubbles inside the games that, that get this kind of dismissal. And again, it's it's funny how the same claims repeat when we go further. Uh, for instance, the inside free-to-play games, there's this a cluster of mobile or casual free-to-play games that get even more of this kind of dismissal. And and the same arguments of them being unimportant, waste of time, uh, they they cost too much, um, the content is bad for you, there's violence, um, and, and so on. And it, it just, even though we have that for the digital games as a whole, then we, we keep on seeing parts of that culture uh, as, a, as a similar way. And I think we should learn to be better in this. So we can watch or check again this slide of, of effects of on game experiences of free-to-play. So does it really weaken the game experience or does it just make it different? And does it make the game unfair if you can pay for it? Oh, is it just un differently fair? It's it's not, mm -hmm. not maybe more unfair or less unfair, but it's just different. Uh, and then expanding too far or ruining games. I I don't think that games can be ruined in this way. Uh, for instance, they do have impact to other games, but but um, it's not free to play games that are ruining the games. It's 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 the games evolving and changing as they always have had. Or the players are ruining and the games. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that. Well, if we talk about, mm. for instance, toxic culture, so yes. it's like it's actually the fingers should be sometimes pointed towards the players too. Yeah, definitely. Sure. Okay, so recapping. Um, Free-to-play games have changed games. They have changed game industry and they have changed the ways of playing. And this change, I think, is permanent. So we cannot go back. There will be. I don't think there will be a time when there no longer are free-to-play games. The size of them in the market can change, but I don't think we will ever see a day without them. And similarly, I don't think single-purchase games or other revenue models are disappearing either. Uh, for instance, uh, AAA games, I think, and, and premium games had a pretty good years recently and there are a lot of new games coming out but some of them are impacted by the changes and maybe here it's just it's not only the like the greediness of the maybe the developers trying to get all money out of the players maybe it's also the fact that that um, the price of premium games has been pretty much the same throughout the years and that money compared to today's worth is is much more mm -hmm. and while we think that the games are really expensive with 60 and now even 70 euros per game it's it's not as expensive as it was like decades ago like in the 90s for instance and when the uh, making the games has exponentially gotten more expensive than uh, and the prices do not get higher, there's increasing risk making AAA games. And they might have to try to find more revenues elsewhere. So this might also have an influence why they are trying to find these ways. Of course, there are also ways that just feel like greedy. Um, but not all of the ways are. And yeah, need for a critical view. Because free to play games as games in general are important. So we need to approach them openly and critically. Games in general, but also free to play games. And we need to also attend to the problems in these games. 
So I, I, I talk a lot about how these games are maybe misunderstood, maybe unappreciated, may, maybe uh, they are positive influence on, on the game industry, but there are problems there that we need to look into. So we need both critical research to research these problems and, and their impacts. We cannot just guess these things. We have to have the research. And then maybe we also need to have the legislation and regulations to be continuously updated to tackle these problems. Okay, so, so finally I just quickly sum up what I have said so far. I mentioned that free-to-play games, they have many roots, they did not appear suddenly, uh, but they do now, like in the recent years, have become immensely successful. Uh, there, have, there has been vocal negative attitudes towards these games, uh, but free-to-play model is just one of many, many models, and it does have connections to other models. Uh, the development of free-to-play games have to take into account the ARM model that I explained, and monetization, it is largely based on in-app purchases. But there's also ethical problems with some of the games and ways that they are designed. But even w when there are problems, it's not, it doesn't mean that they are not valuable. So free-to-play games are a valuable part of our gaming culture, and they do deserve a critical view. Okay, thank you. Thank you. That's amazing. Mm. Thank you for these these lessons. Really good uh, mm. kind of a basic building blocks to mm. understand critically. Like uh, many of us can kind of develop this kind of a critical voice that I don't mm. like them or I don't yeah. like to pay for anything or or I don't like the way that uh, my favorite game was changed because of the model. But in order to really look into more like a mature way of criti criticizing mm. needs yes. more understanding of the field and it's constantly yeah. also evolving uh, how it works. Yep. There was an interesting question from the students uh, from the pre-assignment uh, is that what do you say like um, uh, what is the factor for Finnish game companies to be so good at at the free-to-play yeah, model also over yeah, the years? Yeah, that's also a question that I found also quite yeah. interesting. Yeah. Uh, I, I think there's a couple of things. One is that we've been so good at mobile games doing mobile games because of Nokia. So we already had the snake in the beginning <laughs> of mobile yeah. games. And Nokia did uh, put a lot of uh, resources into making mobile games. Mm -hmm. And the whole Engage thing and, and all those other games. The and whole Engage thing <laughs> it has, it has its weight in itself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. But, but yeah, but so it, yeah. we were very early in yes, the Yes, we were very mobile. early. Yeah, and I I think when when Nokia collapsed at that one point, and a lot of the previous employers employees of Nokia, they founded game companies, and because they already knew this market, they maybe then started making these these mobile games or casual games, mm. and I think that that is still something that shows that we have we were really early in the market, and we have a lot of experience and and like mm. veterans. Yeah. I remember, um, so again, going back to my experience as coming from Korea, is that I remember uh, at some point in GDC, um, this was the time when Facebook game was starting mm -hmm. to emerge. You know, remember back in those times? Mm -hmm. Zing and time, yeah. there was a like, discussion ongoing on both GDC and E3. You know, there's a panel discussion, like a very strong uh, panel discussion about free to play. Mm -hmm. And there was whole discussions about is free to play gonna work in <laughs> global? Is it just Korean thing? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And there was a I, I remember there was it is, it's <laughs> just Korean. <laughs> yeah. So there was like <laughs> something a genetic in here. Game developer from, from Korea, <laughs> yeah. like talking about like mm -hmm. free to play, mm -hmm. and then the another side of, uh, of game developers, mostly coming from America, was yeah. like arguing that of course once i said well it could work in other country as well and then an american developer was like no way we're not going to accept this <laughs> <laughs> this is absolutely not possible and this is way back 10 years ago more than yeah. 10 years ago when i visited you see back then and now here we are mm -hmm. 
And, and this is a GDC fin- and then, week. Yeah, yeah. And, then, and in Finland, and like nobody w- in that panel was discussing about Finland at that yeah, time. Yeah, mm. yeah. Like, would small European country across America, across the continent, would be adopting free to play so yeah. quickly yeah. on mobile? Nobody predicted that at that time. But time also, at the, at the maybe at the time that this panel was. GDC was specifically not really interested in mobile games. Like that mm. was an area that also gaming journalists were not covering at all. It took so long before any of the games were reviewed or yeah. or and it still is kind of like that's not the area where the game journalists always want to be at. There's like specific outlets that are looking at the uh, like Pocket Gamer, for instance, for the mobile field. Mm-hmm. And it's interesting, like now that the devices have gone so like a, a over the top i would say that they come so that they come closer so that they, so there isn't that division is, is that you play with the dummy console you actually play mm. with the similar uh, efficiency uh, than the the console mm. or the or the pc or people are not advancing their pcs anymore in the same way i guess also that's that's yeah. happening mm. it's just mobile and and because also there's so many more players out there that we can't rely when we make games we can't rely on that small niche which it mm. is uh, in this global market now that 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 would would be the ones that are very techy oriented it's like we we play games with like lesser computers than what some people played 10 years ago mm. <laughs> Uh, so this is really interesting how all these kind of dismissal things within the industry, externally to the industry, within the gamer communities, outside the gamer communities, they have these certain dynamics on this phenomenon mm-hmm. that how we work on this. And uh, so, yeah, this like free to play is now so dominant also in the so-called AAA games. Mm. It's, it's becoming one of the yeah. most mm-hmm. common yeah, so probably, Kati, your uh, kind of a research period was, like, what was the time span of your research since which year to when you did it your dissertation? Was, uh, from 2012 until 2020, although yeah. I didn't collect any data in the end, end phase anymore. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So it's like, a, for in, in this couple of years already, there's there's been, like, yeah. a, obviously, pandemic feels like still like this huge time sink mm. that doesn't even exist. But but there's a there's just a kind of recent uh, developments within the past five years that yeah definitely like for instance we just we did look into some of the top crossing list and PUBG Mobile was there mm-hmm. and I was like PUBG Mobile yeah <laughs> that, that's like <laughs> that's that's a trend wow. thing. Well, yeah. yeah it is a huge there's thing it is yeah. a huge <laughs> thing of course yeah, yeah. Fortnite has a mobile oh, version indeed. Yeah. League of Legends yeah. has a mobile version exactly. so I it's mean, like uh, like going back. Like five years, the attitudes were really different, and now that mm-hmm. the the kind of the device is so much like normalized, mm-hmm. the mobile device, and then it it's just so hooked up with the with the app stores and mm-hmm. and marketplaces where it's like easy to pay. Like in in some of the like previous years, we had when we looked at this kind of a how do you pay for the pool, for instance, for Sulake's <laughs> yeah. product in Hapa Hotel, is that they they invented a lot of different ways. They had to have a lot of different ways to get the money in so for instance our local finnish uh what are they called like smaller uh shops had the 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 credits that you could buy for Habbo hotel yeah so there's so true. many in- mm. inventions of how mm-hmm. do you get the actual money in and now it's so so easy when people are buying yeah. a lot of things in in the e-commerce yeah and, and facebook games were starting they had these uh different tasks that you could do, like fill a survey or something, and oh then yeah. you would get a few credits for the game or, or yeah. play this other game or something. And some of them were really dubious like yeah. for first. Yeah. So it's like the, the huge, the, the area, like you had the, um, the, the model with the uh, acquisition, retention and monetization. Mm-hmm. So it's like in order to get to the top nowadays, the acquisition part is just super expensive, but yeah. still very lucrative. Like the big, com- big companies, they put a lot of money and when I started as a game scholar, uh, there was no such budget in mm-hmm. game studios yeah. as kind of acquisition yeah, or right. advertising even. It's like Perfect you just work, gave, yeah. the, gave your yeah. game to mm. a publisher and they took uh, yeah. care of the rest. And that's a big problem now for the market because the big companies that are already there, like yeah. Supercell and King and all these, they, they can spend the money to get players and they have already existing audience anyway. Yeah, yeah. And then if smaller companies try to get there, they have to get really lucky. They have to get featured or something to get yeah. get there. You get, get enough the players mm. to play the game. Yeah. 
but there's like and again i would like oftentimes when we talk about games it's in this um bubble of games so if we think about similar things like i don't know nestle or or like a bigger companies that have these huge machineries to advertise their product so if you want to for instance uh, it's actually quite close to game industry itself. Like if you want to make it in the toy industry, it's almost impossible to go through the metal mm -hmm. and other big companies because they have the the shelf space, they have the advertising yeah. uh, yeah. Uh, machines. So it's like it's almost imp it's near impossible. It's even more hard in the toy industry to to mm -hmm. get to the top. That we still have opportunistic uh, places for companies to become big in a overnight almost mm -hmm. to some some really rare examples um but in the in the physical world no yeah. it doesn't happen so mm -hmm. when we criticize when we critically think about how the like a money machines work and the in in our regular lives we mm -hmm. don't we're not mm -hmm. aware of all of yeah, this we don't think about point. it well at mm -hmm. least in a finnish context yes but at least in over like in a big mega cities well, let's say seoul for example um, you see game advertisements on the metro, mm. on the billboard, a huge the advertisement and promotion effort they, they do in order to promote any games like PC games or mobile games. Once the bigger the budget is, the like the high more likely that you will be promoted in the real world. Mm -hmm. And we're talking about the metro line or bus lines where just non-gamers, gamers alike, they mm -hmm. use public transportation and they see game advertisement mm. and that definitely affects uh like in potential incoming players as well as how the society looks into the game how, how mature mm. this industry have become mm. Mm. and you can actually see that in everyday life in many mega, mega cities these days like yeah. london yeah. um in in california also you mm. see game advertisements mm -hmm. yeah it's it, it, it didn't exist it was in the yeah. game magazines mm -hmm. you had to find yeah. the advertisements right. it's yeah. no longer kind no. of like it's no longer niche or nerdy yeah in, in culture we still kind of we still kind of <laughs> rely on that it's like yes this is this is a small underdog phenomenon yeah, yeah. No. Uh, that's true i was i was surprised <laughs> by this like in finland a bus stop had a huge ad advertise for the new upcoming pokemon game yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. and that didn't happen when I was younger. Like it, it, Holy it sanctity <laughs> has been broken. <laughs> 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 we need to shove the games yeah. back to the closet yeah, to where they belong to. Yeah, it used to be so precious, so <laughs> precious to yeah. toy. And then now everybody knows what that is. Mm -hmm. And it's becoming more popular and, and common. If ever. Uh, there, there's a question in the, in the live stream. So how has free-to-play affected the quality of live services? Mm. And there's a point of uh, towards the... A court war zone, technical issues, and absence of new content in ha High Halo Infinity. Uh, so it's like uh, I, I don't know these cases too well, but I guess there is some kind of a discussion about how the model I impacts the way that the, the games provide content. Um, mm. Hmm. I yeah, guess it's also related to how a company communicates with their players yeah. about mm. the, for example, the odds of the loot box. So yeah. if you're selling mm. the loot box, how many how likely that I'm gonna earn these yeah. items or not? Mm. Yeah. Can you reveal that information? And yeah. some companies would do, some companies mm. would not, and it also depends on the countries, country. I, and I think that, like for instance, in Finland, the the odds for scratch tickets that needs to be it's an available. It needs to be open information, so this cannot never be hidden. Mm. Mm. So as Kati was talking, that uh, the regulations there are already existing regulations and legislations for for playing this type of games and, and maybe some of the game industry would need to follow and we need to redefine how mm. gambling, for instance, or what is applied into this field. Mm -hmm. But it's like, um, so for instance, I play Destiny 2, uh, which uh, first wasn't a free-to-play yeah. model. I guess it wasn't first. The first one wasn't. The second one was like from the release, I can't remember. Mm. Uh, so it does kind of it doesn't actually show to me at all like as a player I don't really I don't pay too much attention to to the model mm -hmm. so I wonder if they are doing bad <laughs> because I don't pay attention to it so I, mm -hmm. I should be maybe more aggressively placed as a as a uh, paying customer mm -hmm. but then again I I always pay for the subscription <laughs> thing so that's <laughs> right that's already okay. there that, yeah. that that's that's enough for them I guess right for, right, right, right. for uh, financing things but you can still buy smaller things in, okay. in yeah. the in app purchases mm -hmm. 
But yeah, uh, any, any other questions that we have? It was for me at least like throughout this Twitch conversation going on while the lecture was happening, uh, there was also comments about like whether this is a split between, you know, casual gamers versus ca serial real gamers, whether mm -hmm. like the criticism towards free to play mobile games um, about r it's ruining the games, it's mm -hmm. breaking the uh, balance, etc. Wouldn't that be involved with this split between gamers? And that's like, yeah, is. somewhat related. And there was also another comment from the test, like maybe like uh, there was also one comment that I assume casual casual gamers may not necessarily acknowledge them as gamers, yeah. gamers per yeah. se. I found this quite interesting mm -hmm. as Korean. Mm -hmm, because mm -hmm. hardcore gamers are free to play gamers yeah, yeah, yeah. ever since mm -hmm. I was like born yeah, and raised, yeah. you know, and then heavily monetizing spending gamers in mm -hmm. free to play mobile games, even. Mm -hmm. mm. Uh, are core gamers that's what kind of I acknowledge all the time, yeah. yeah. So it's a culturally different, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. So that's that's this this topic itself is very fascinating for mm -hmm. me, mm -hmm. like. Relating free to play with casual mobile, and I'm not like yeah, mm. this is quite interesting moment for me. Yeah, I, I think that is something that I would like to research more. Like the the casual players, like the casual players mm. of of the, well, the, the players who don't think the games are that important, they just want to play them mm. to spend some time, because that is a problem with research that I've done and that many others have done. That they it's e easy to find. Certain type of players. audience yeah. to answer your surveys and answer your interviews, mm. but it's really hard to get that like huge audience that is out there mm. that just don't think they are that that like important. Just just spend some time with them. It's like like browsing TikTok or YouTube mm -hmm. or yeah. something. And those those numbers are big. Those, yes. are those kind of players are just they consist mm -hmm. the majority of the some of the games, and it's interesting. Like when we, for instance, in the, in the Back in the day, we looked at the casual turn. Uh, it's just that um, that the, the term itself has this connotation that people don't use time. But then at the same mm. time, there is already back in the yes. day, like a, a decade ago, that these people actually spend a lot of like considerable amount of time mm -hmm. uh, playing the games, but they just don't form their identity. So they kind exactly. of don't identify as a gamer. Uh, it comes with that mm -hmm. thing too. But there's like so many things happened already in this period of 10 years or more mm, mm, that mm. games have changed uh, mm. in terms of their relation to the society. So that's that's one of the things that I find at least really, mm. really interesting. Yes. But how much access uh, as a researcher you have for other than Western culture games? Because there's like language barrier, for instance, that mm. you can't really like how much in, in your research, for instance, you were playing yourself in order to understand the the different mechanics um, in the games. Yeah, I was playing quite many games, uh, but all of the games that I was playing were published in the West. Mm -hmm. uh, all of our informants were, I think, maybe even Finnish. Mm -hmm. uh, so most that I got from uh, any like a Asian gaming, for instance, mm -hmm. any Korean gaming, or Chinese gaming was from research papers from other people. Oh, yeah, right, right. Second-hand right. yeah. information. Second-hand information. Yeah. It, it so this is one of the things that we can't see the entire mm -hmm. phenomenon at exactly. large because th th this world is still not really that global. Mm -hmm. Right. And it's a very cultural thing. I and mean, we, we even call game as cultural industry. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. very subjective in the mm -hmm. region to region, country mm -hmm. to country, and even players themselves as well. Yes. So like it, it's definitely very subjective and very culturally interpretative mm -hmm. uh, faction uh, features as well. So. And another t comment that just came up yep. from the Twitch is that um, regarding the interactions of free-to-play games with the larger game medium, uh, Katin, maybe can you name some of the examples of groundbreaking game design that we probably not have would ha would not have without free-to-play game? Mm. Yeah, that's and a big like, question. Yeah, yeah that's that a big is. question. But can you name some, like can you maybe give us some examples? Like I I think. Um, at least this kind of uh, like uh, waiting mechanics, yeah. mm -hmm. 
and like putting something to progress and then waiting it to come something in real time, not not in like game time. I think that is something that has spread also to other games outside free to play games, just because it's fun mm-hmm. and it's it works well. I think it wo- yeah, World of Warcraft I think implemented something like this for yeah. instance in their game at some point. Mm. Uh, so that is at least something mm, that's a would need to think <laughs> to, to get all, all all of all of the stuff because there are like these kind of things yes. that have fallen yeah, from yeah. them. Yeah. 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 Multiple mm. currency. We also m- you mentioned about yeah. that like double that's currency system. And I mm. think that's definitely derived from free to play. Mm. Yeah. Mechanics. It's like, a, so it's like a difference between it. the currency that mm-hmm. you can earn in yeah. game versus mm. you can only get it by paying the actual mm-hmm. money. Mm. So those double currency policy definitely uh, mm. like that, that that also complicates a lot of design mechanics as mm. well <laughs> for designers to think like how are you going to balance out yeah. between the real cur- real <laughs> currency <laughs> versus um uh soft currency and hard currency balance how are you going to balance each other mm. and it's very challenging i mm-hmm. think that's one of the challenging like balance yeah. level design t- mm. task yeah or game mm. designers these days. Yeah. Uh, like the title of the game designer oftentimes nowadays is combined with the monetization mm-hmm. designer because mm-hmm. it's so well yeah. weaved in. The, I'm on, I'm g- I'm going to ask a last question from mm. Kati uh, since it's a uh, couple of minutes to uh, five now. Um, so what like in terms of for instance like Finnish or European laws what, what do you think would be the like some of the regulations that we would need to now consider the, the the most important like what is the direction for mm. regulating in in terms of like keeping out the dark patterns and and keeping out the exploit in mm. in free to play games model i think one important is definitely the age limits right like uh, and I, i i don't want to give an answer how that would be implemented mm-hmm. but we do need to take the monetization into account when we assign like age limits to the games yeah and it's More. currently just content like uh substance Mo- it's abuse mostly and sexual mostly that yeah. yes yeah. so i i think that would be the first yeah uh, and um, then maybe the the visibility of of purchases so you have to know what you are getting for yeah. instance what you mentioned about the loot boxes that they have the the probabilities of, of different types of content yeah it should so be open information that, yeah. that should be open information yeah. mm. for example there was a there is a still ongoing mm. huge uh legislative discussions about this disclo- uh disclosing of information of the loot box mm-hmm. over there in korea mm-hmm. and it's becoming like a huge gamer movement mm. also there it yeah. has a very strong impact yeah so gradually games are becoming part of the normal fabric of society <laughs> They need to be similarly le- regulated. Then, for instance, we need to know what's in the milk bo- carton mm-hmm. box uh, so that exactly. it's always safe to drink. So in the same way that when we buy a game from an app store, for instance, we need to know that it's safe to play mm-hmm. so it doesn't exploit us. Thank you, yes. Kati, for joining us. And Thank you for having me. And giving the critical views and us a little bit food for thought to think maturely on, on this topic, not just like ranting that they're <laughs> shitty or not just thinking they're beautiful. <laughs> so it's just uh, the critical view is always considering the both of the sides, yeah. like what's happening yeah. there. So thanks for this view. Acknowledging mm. what yeah. is <laughs> there, yes. yeah. And hopefully you audience, you got uh, a lot of the things to kind of process your own playing habits and process your future endeavors also in game making perhaps that how do you do this even before the regulations how do you actually make more ethical play and maybe we will have more discussions mm-hmm. like this like the ethical guidelines yep. that you could have or developing games uh in this field yep and mm-hmm. i also want to announce that um We also do play together sessions yes. before or after the lecture. So after this lecture, I think it's going to happen again this Friday. Uh, this Friday, actually, on our Discord server. So we're going to go through several free to play games mm-hmm. and play a bit, and then actually go to the shop and like see what are they're selling, yeah. <laughs> see what are they're doing, yeah. and how their tactic is. So if anybody's are watching the stream, if you found this topic fascinating, then do join us on this games now play together session yeah. that it happens on our discord server 
And so. we, if we're lucky, we also get cut into that mm-hmm. session. Yeah. So it's not just playing the games. It's, it's a lot about also chatting and you can come and listen. Just eavesdrop there or just join the discussion as well. So yes. That's important. You want Notice Friday. for everybody. <laughs> So we're going to wrap it up and, and say bye-bye to everybody. Make sure that you follow all the channels. As always, follow all the channels. That's important. <laughs> you and can come to the Discord because we're going to soon have an amazing game jam. Yes. That is open for a lot of like cultural differences. in, in Yes, the, in so you can theme. find more b- information about this Play Together session <laughs> as well as the game jam, all, all available on our social media. So keep posting. Uh, do follow us and then yeah <laughs> next week next week is gonna have we're gonna have a game jam so yeah so bye everybody and stay safe bye bye bye